Hi, this is Malayan Verveer. And this is Kim Azzarelli. And we're co-hosts of Seneca's Conversations on Power and Purpose, brought to you by the Seneca Women Podcast Network and iHeartRadio. We're launching a brand new season of this podcast, which brings you fascinating conversations with leaders like two-time gold medalist, author, and activist, Abby Wambach, and actor, producer, and entrepreneur, Justin Baldoni, among many others. Listen to Seneca's Conversations on Power and Purpose on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Peace to the planet, Charlemagne the God here, and it is a privilege and honor to introduce to you a new podcast, Straight Shot, No Chaser, hosted by a queen named Teslin Figaro. She is the hood whisperer in this game of politics, debuting on my new Black Effect podcast network on iHeartRadio. This is Teslin Figaro. On my podcast, we'll cover politics, Black lifestyle, racial justice, and food for the soul to inspire you. Come sip this truth with me. Subscribe now and listen to Straight Shot, No Chaser with Teslin Figaro on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to Stuff to Blow Your Mind, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, welcome to Stuff to Blow Your Mind. My name's Robert Lamb. And I'm Joe McCormick, and today we're bringing you some listener mail. Now, our trusty mailbot, Carney, has gone through a brilliant transformation where he has become a nagglebot, a nail-faring bot. Or, wait, no, not nail-faring, a, 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 a office floor-faring bot made of the nails of the dead. Yeah, at least the exoskeleton, anyway. I think everything underneath is, you know, still has to be made of the same material, but on the outside... He is now a uh, finger and toenail based uh, automaton. And he belongs to Musebell. Uh, should we jump right in with emails about our episodes on the tomato? Yeah, why not? Uh, let's go right from uh, <laughs> from nails to uh, tomatoes here. Um, uh, as always, Carney is delivering the listener mail that you, the listener, have lovingly um, sent in to us. Uh, do you want to start with this one from Ian here? Are you okay if I read this one? Go for it. Okay. Ian says, Hi, Robert and Joe. Still in partial lockdown here in the UK and eternally grateful for your rich back catalog of rabbit holes to keep me occupied. I think I can offer some insight into the tomaco plant. Grafting tomatoes isn't that uncommon and used to be more popular. The usual reason to do it is improved hardiness and soil type tolerance. The one I've read most about is Datura as a rootstock, which is supposed to make the tomato much more cold-resistant and tolerant of alkaline soil, but has been known to lead to toxic tomatoes. I read some speculation that it depends on exactly how much of the Datura above-ground parts remain, and it's probably better to just not go there. And in fact, we're going to have another email about this in just a moment. But Ian continues... One I've tried to do myself and failed, but is available as a novelty plant in the UK, is the tomtato with potato roots on the bottom. I know a horticulturist who's played around with this. You don't get a great yield of either crop, but if you don't have much space... He also tried it the other way around, which led to potato stems growing small green tubers at the bottom leaf nodes. Interesting, but pointless. <laughs> Uh, and then Ian shares a link. I've tried wild tomatoes. I got seeds from a botanist colleague. The plants were leggy, sprawling vines that made small, orangish berries. The flesh was mealy, vaguely sweet and sharp. Not great, but if you were foraging, I could see them being an important food source. Thanks for the amazing content, Ian. Wow, I am jealous, Ian, that you've gotten to try like a, a traditional ancestral wild tomato plant. I, I have no idea what that would be like. Uh, it, it's it's crazy. He he reminds me of something that I should have thought of in the episode as we were recording it. But if you play, if you've played any of the Fallout games, uh, I'm not sure at what point this first shows up. Uh, but certainly in Fallout 4 and definitely in Fallout 76, which I, I, I play from time to time uh, still to this day, um, you, can, you can raise a garden. You, you know, you're crafting. And so there's a lot of survival of, um, uh, mechanics bound up in the game. But one of the plants you grow is something called a tato. And, um, you know, it looks like a, like a tomato on a vine, but it is supposed to be a mutated hybrid of the tomato and the potato plant. Wow. Yeah. 
Huh. So basically, I mean, it's very, or at least very similar to what we're talking about here uh, with the novelty plant one can obtain in the UK. Very interesting. Yeah, I, I would like to see one of those plants. Yeah, well, uh, come come to my camp in Fallout 76, Joe, and you'll find <laughs> several of them growing. Oh, okay. You doing a lot of agriculture there? Well, you know, just enough uh, <laughs> for crafting purposes, yes. I recall some funny dynamics in, in the Fallout games where you could you could essentially, you know, you'd have a problem where you weren't generating enough food for your settlement, and you could solve that just by just by growing watermelons exclusively. So, you know. Well, you know, it's a post-apocalyptic days, so, uh, you know, you, you get what you get and you don't pitch a fit, right? <laughs> I guess so. Uh, our next message comes from longtime correspondent Jim in New Jersey, who has something to add on uh, basically the same topic that, that Ian raised here, but goes into more mysterious detail. Yeah. Uh, so Jim writes, your tomato podcast reminded me of something a little unusual from The Medical Detectives, which is an anthology of true medical mystery articles originally published in The New Yorker. Spoiler alert, I'm going to reveal the main details of the story. But since the article was published 55 years ago, I think it's OK to review <laughs> The article tells the story of a family living on a tobacco farm in Tennessee who became extremely ill after a meal in late October 1963. The meal consisted of split pea soup, spaghetti with meat sauce, sliced tomatoes, sweet bread, and cornbread. Their symptoms were so bad that they sought medical help. They were flailing their limbs and hallucinating. The ER doctors ruled out tobacco poisoning just from handling it in the barns. They suspected botulism, but their symptoms were more severe than botulism toxicology reports were normal. The article then spends a page or two describing Jimson weed, which is also in the nightshade family, along with tomatoes and tobacco. Jimson weed causes the symptoms they were experiencing, but they didn't eat any Jimson weed. The mystery continues. Jimson weed is hardy, and it can withstand the first several frosts of fall. The husband had grafted a tomato plant onto a Jimson weed to extend his tomato season. They had eaten the first tomato of that graft in late October. When asked how he came up with the idea, he said a neighbor had been doing it for years. The neighbor, who had not gotten ill, grafted his tomato plants on the base of the Jimson weed. The man who had gotten sick grafted his on the branches of the Jimson weed. The article isn't definitive, but it suggests that the graft uh, with more Jimson weed produced more toxins that found their way into the tomatoes than the graft with less Jimson weed. The other farmer could have been more tolerant to the toxins, too. Uh, so this is interesting. Oh, one thing that's worth noting, I guess we didn't say this, is that Jimson weed is an example of, uh, or I guess is the same thing as Datura, the the plant mentioned by Ian in the last article. And that so that you can graft them together and grow tomatoes that are edible, but it apparently depends on like where you graft it and how much of the Jimson plant you use. So that could be the case with the tobacco tomato graft as well, but I guess we don't know for sure. By the way, uh, I uh, I don't think we heard any heard from anybody about this, but just doing a quick search around, it looks like you could, of course it makes sense given the, the nightshade family, but it looks like grafting can also take place between eggplants and tomatoes. Oh, okay, yeah, egg tomatoes, <laughs> or if you go with their more elegant name, uh, Auburn tomatoes. Either one will work, yeah. <laughs> All right, but that wasn't all. We, we heard from a lot of people about tomatoes. Yeah, we also got a short message from June. June says, hi, Robert and Joe. Just listen to your tomato part one episode. I love your show and completely agree with you about the superiority of fresh tomatoes over store-bought tomatoes. But I had to write in in defense of the tomato hornworm. <laughs> I know it's a crop pest, but it's also just a cute, chunky caterpillar and doesn't deserve its historic reputation as some kind of gross or poisonous worm. I still remember finding one on our tomato plants as a kid and being fascinated by seeing a caterpillar that big. Maybe this is my biologist side outweighing my gardener side, but I think they're pretty cool. Looking forward to part two. Best, June. Well, June, I hope you liked part two. I don't recall us really slandering the, the tobacco hornworm except to note the, what was historically said about it, right? Right, right. Um, I think we just said that it looked kind of interesting and had kind of a, a gnarly looking horn. But yeah, it was the historical accounts that really, there was one in particular, and I believe that was um, outlined in that uh, that main tomato book that we were referring to. Mm -hmm. 
that that people were just so horrified by it that they considered just never eating tomatoes again, just abandoning their tomato garden and just surrendering it to these uh, the, the, these hordes of weird creatures. Uh, I mean, it was enough to kind of make you wonder: Are they talking about the same organism, or or perhaps they were dealing with just a, a an excessive amount of them? Because certainly, uh, one can see how one of these caterpillars might be interesting, whereas a whole writhing swarm of them might be enough to, to, to turn one's stomach. I don't know. All right, here's another uh, bit of uh, tomato listener mail. This one comes to us from Keegan. Hi, Robert and Joe. It's been a bit since I've sent in some fan mail, but after hearing you two talk about how most kitchen knowledge is strange hearsay, I simply had to write in. You may be interested in a cookbook that a friend of mine got for me recently that may provide some illumination on the myths and misinformation that pervade typical kitchen knowledge. You actually mentioned the author in part two of the Tomato Tomato episodes, too. The Food Lab by J. Kenji Lopez-Alt. Uh, He goes into full detail of how to prepare a lot of different meals, how to store food, and how to do basic kitchen tasks, all enhanced by science. He's done hundreds of tests on dozens of recipes and goes through a full explanation of the how and why. As someone who wanted to learn cooking but also wanted to understand why I was doing the things I was doing so I could apply it to more than recipe, it's a lovely cookbook. Hope y'all are doing well, and I'm glad to hear Joe has jumped onto the D&D train recently. (laughs) Sincerely, Keegan. Well, Keegan, uh, I've got some news that may not be surprising. I actually own this book, The Food Lab by J. Kenji Lopez-Alt. I've actually been following... Uh, Kenji's recipes and and writing for years. He he used to do a lot of writing for the website Serious Eats, and I love his approach. But yeah, he because he he does exactly what you're talking about. He doesn't just give you a recipe or tell you a technique to use. He explains why you do it, and and the why is actually informed by empirical testing, not just by you know sort of received knowledge passed down from from cook to cook or chef to chef over the years because as we said in the episode that kind of received knowledge in fact contains a lot of misinformation stuff that isn't actually based on on anything empirical it's just something somebody said at some point and and now it's uh now it's just how you do it a lot of a lot of times you don't have to do it that way huh. well my approach is more um Mine is not to to question Martha why mine is but to do and die. I just I just <laughs> do what Martha says, and uh, it it tends to work out pretty well. Well, I think Keegan points out a very important reason though to learn why, which is that learning the why of of things you do in the kitchen makes you a more versatile cook. It makes you less True. shackled to individual recipes because once you understand the reason for doing something, you understand now, oh, okay, this technique can be applied to this other type of dish or this other type of preparation or that it can't and why. Yeah, this is true. And uh, I, I, I kid, I do, I do love some robust instructions that I can follow to the letter. But I, I, I have gotten to the point where, yeah, I, I, I understand some of the things enough to where I can I can be a little bit flexible. Like if I want to cut a little time off, I can realize, oh, well, I could do this instead or mm-hmm. I can bust out, you know, I can bust out the Instapot here because I'm doing the same thing that that she's asking me to do, et cetera. Now you've inspired a question that has nothing to do with any of what we were just talking about, but it's that you call it an Instapot. I call it an Instapot. Everybody I know calls it an Instapot, but it's not called an Instapot. It's an instant pot, and nobody says the T at the end of the first word. Why is that? Is it Instagram or something like that is just like causing us to leap over that letter? Oh, really? Is it not called? It is. It, yeah, you're right. It's an instant pot, not an Instapot. I don't who, know. Who the heck says instant <laughs> pot? Nobody says that. <laughs> it's the Instagram of pots, the world cross. Huh. Surely they've um, they've copyrighted Instapot as well, just realizing that's what everybody calls it. This, it's a strange case because a lot of times you see people using the uh, specific uh, brand name for something as the generic name. But in this case, everybody's referring to it as a thing that is as if this is the the specific um, product name, but it's not. <laughs> like, and yeah. I, I don't think I'd realized it till just now. <laughs> it's as if the generic term for bandages had become ban aid <laughs> or the generic term for tissues had become Kleex. Yeah, I can't think of another case exactly like this. This is interesting. 
All right. Well, I guess we're going to jump on to email that we got in response to the Horned Helm episodes. Now, the context that this email, I think, is responding to specifically was a biological portion where we were looking for examples of animals that build some form of helmet or horned helmet. Uh, One was a type of caterpillar that would stack uh, old parts of its exoskeleton on top of its head. And so form a little hat there. But we also talked about caddisflies. Caddisflies aren't – or caddisfly larvae to be specific. Uh, The caddisfly isn't a perfect example because it doesn't really seem to be a helmet that goes on its head. But it does create a hard surface that it lives inside. It's really more of a kind of a rock diaper than a helmet. (laughs) I guess not even necessarily rock, just materials from its environment reinforced with silk. But anyway, Taylor writes in and says, hey, Robert and Joe. Taylor again, longtime fan and now frequent correspondent. I was listening to part one of your horned helm duo today and took offense on behalf of caddisfly larvae everywhere when Robert expressed that they look a little trashy. Robert, I usually respect your instincts, but after spending several months last year netting caddisfly larvae out of local creeks for entomological study, I have to see if I can change your mind. Caddisflies aren't picky architects. They work with the materials available to them, and it's true that the cases they make out of mud, sticks, and plant offal aren't much to look at. But if provided with the proper materials, the caddisfly larva is an absolute artist. When caddisflies spawn in clear rivers with a lot of minuscule rocks, the cases they make look like mosaics carried on their backs. And with the right patron, the caddisfly can really shine. There are artisans who rear caddisfly larvae in pools they've littered with gems, pearls, and gold shavings to make jewelry. The caddisflies do as they're wont to do and spin beautiful cases from their sponsor's materials. When the caddisflies mature, they abandon these bejeweled cases for the artist to collect. The abandoned caddisfly cases are then sealed with resin and sold as earrings or necklace pendants. Depending on the materials used, this jewelry can sell for hundreds or even thousands of dollars. I've included a few images here for you to check out and describe to your listeners if you'd like. The first is of a caddisfly collected from the wild, and the second of one reared by a jeweler. If you search for caddisfly jewelry online, you can find hundreds of designs people have collaborated on with these tiny trichopterans. As always, I love your show, and I'm immensely grateful for the weird and wonderful content you continue to entertain and educate me with. I've been pretty isolated during this pandemic, and it's nice to have your voices in my ears as I'm painting or doing any number of more monotonous things throughout the day. Thanks again, and I hope I've changed your minds about the caddis fly. (laughs) Well, thank you, Taylor. Uh, Yeah, I would say my mind is is definitely changed on on these guys. Uh, I'm looking... Uh, I, I looked at the images that, that they sent in. Uh, I'm also looking at an article on thisiscolossal.com um, from 2014 titled Artist Hubert Duprat Collaborates with Caddisfly Larvae as They Build Aquatic Cocoons from Gold and Pearls. And this is a really cool article. It has some nice uh, high-quality images and even a, uh, an animated uh, gif of, uh, of the caddisfly building the cocoon out of uh, bits of gold leaf. And yeah, the results are really impressive. It's a it's a it's a fascinating idea for a collaboration between um, Larva and artist, and, and the results do have this weird, uh, yeah, this 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 very weird organic quality to them, while still being made out of these, um, you know, these materials that humans consider precious. I can just imagine some high society function where you're admiring someone's earrings, and they're like, ah, yes, this was a butt sack made by the larvae of an insect. You know what it reminds me of as well is the um, the, uh, the the golden scales of uh, of Smog the dragon from The Hobbit. You know, mm. he's supposed to have all the the, the gold that's become embedded uh, in his otherwise vulnerable belly. Uh, this uh, this kind of has that kind of feel to it right here. All right, uh, now let's get to the nail based content. Man, Carney is shaking with delight. There are just nails pouring off of him onto the floor. <laughs> All right, uh, this one comes to us from Ryan. Hello, I was uh, compelled to write to you after listening to your podcast about fingernails, specifically about how to stop biting them. 
I'm in my late 20s and I have always bitten my nails, sometimes to the point where I get hangnails or have ingrown nails as well. Last year I got married and wanted to make sure my fingernails looked nice in case there were close-up photos of my hands for the ring. This may not work for everyone, but it worked for me. I did a bit of research and I think I ended up using something similar to CBT. The nail biting was a habit, something I did without thinking, so I had to make myself think about it. What worked for me was apologizing to my nails every time I caught myself chewing them. This trained me to interrupt the automatic action, and it was surprisingly effective. Of course, as stress was one of my triggers, the end of the world as we know it in 2020 has caused me to relapse. But at least I know that when I have the mental energy to conquer this habit again, I know it's doable. As a side note, I was also intrigued about the notion that usage of a finger makes the nail grow faster. I noticed that once I stopped chewing and started trimming my nails, I seemed to need to trim them fairly frequently, more so than my partner did. I wonder if the additional wear of decades of chewing encouraged faster than average nail growth. In any case, thank you for the many episodes of thoughtful and insightful discussion. I always enjoy seeing this podcast pop up in my feed with thanks, Ryan. Hmm. Uh, Well, thanks for getting in touch, Ryan. I actually, I don't know if the terminal trauma explanation for the rate of fingernail growth would have lingering effects, like after the the terminal trauma has stopped, uh, even if, you know, even if you've been doing it for years. The stuff I was reading was about like what's happening to your fingers while the nail is growing. So concurrent with the growth, but uh, it's, it's possible. I don't know. That's an interesting question. Okay. Question. Should we read this one from Brittany or will this make people stop listening to the episode? And maybe we, should... um, we, we will give a quick warning. Uh, give us, give us a minute to read this and discuss it. Uh, but if you don't want to hear anything about nail trauma, uh, then you can just, yeah, just skip over this next bit of listener mail and come back in on the next topic. Okay. This is from Brittany. Brittany says, Dear Robert and Joe, when I was 12, I managed to get a fairly big piece of wood stuck under the nail of my left middle finger. I remember it being very painful. It felt like my entire heart was beating in that one spot, but also very interesting to look at. The school nurse didn't have tweezers, so she used nail clippers to fish it out. It took a good while to heal, and whenever any kind of torture involving something being shoved under the nail is mentioned, I can only feel the greatest sympathy having experienced a small taste of it myself. Thanks for the great show, Brittany. Uh, The thing that really stuck out to me about this was the sensation of having your entire heart beating in that one spot. It's like a throbbing that becomes a, a whole body sensation. That's... Ooh, oh man, that's powerful. No, that um, I can definitely relate to that from uh, n- not identical nail trauma, but uh, some nail issues uh, I had, um, you know, a decade or so uh, uh, ago, where like you, the, the the amount of sensation that you feel like uh, in an ingrown toenail uh, can be such that it does feel like all of your nerves are centered on that one spot, you know, that this is the epicenter of all nervous activity in your body. And I guess to a certain extent it is at that point. Okay. Should we put the nail nightmares behind us? Yes, we should. And as a, as a kind of palate cleanser, we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we have all new listener mail to listen to on a variety of different topics. All right, we're back. Oh, and it seems during the break, Carney has undergone a transformation. What is happening here? Uh, it appears, and I'm no expert on this sort of thing. I didn't follow him around, but I think he fell into a pit of snakes and has emerged with uh, with snakes uh, sleeping through the winter inside him, uh, uh, using his, uh, his body as a brumation chamber. So uh, um, he's quite a sight to behold. So what was once a creature of nails is now a creature of snakes. Welcome back, Snakebot. Yes. Okay, so this first message comes to us from David. It was about our episode on PyCrete. We actually got to hear from a structural engineer. That's right. Uh, David writes in and says, Hello, guys. I listened with interest to, to your recent episode on PyCrete. The description of reinforced ice made me think of the more recent practice of fiber-reinforced concrete with either steel or plastic fibers. As a structural engineer, the description of the properties of ice, including creep, mirrors those of concrete. I wonder whether the experiments with pycrete was a precursor to concrete fiber technology, and to some extent, uh, similar fiber reinforcements such as fiberglass and FRP plastic. So, 
in that way, could we say that Jeffrey Pike was a pioneer of fiber reinforcement technology and engineering? David. That's a good question, though I don't think the innovation of putting the wood pulp inside the ice came from Pike himself. That came from, I believe, some researchers uh, in the eastern United States out of, was it Brooklyn Brooklyn Polytechnic? It was something like that. Uh, Mm -hmm. But anyway, Pike uh, had the idea brought to him, and then he he picked up on it. But uh, yeah, good enough, close enough, right? Yeah. uh, Now, it does make me wonder, okay, if we're talking about this sort of composite material— then, you know, where do we rank various paper innovations? Uh, not, not not merely paper itself, but take, for instance, paper mache, uh, which is, a, you know, a, a composite material that has um, paper pieces or pulp, sometimes textiles uh, bound up with an adhesive. And, and this, of course, has been around for quite some time. I believe that, you know, we, we've discussed some very old uh, versions of this uh, in um, – what, uh, uh, Mezzo and uh, uh, South America. Uh, I think it d- dates back to to use in ancient Egypt and, uh, and China as well. Um, so uh, I, I, would, I guess I would be hesitant to, to give Pike too much credit in terms of just overall composite material engineering. But you absolutely got to give him outside-the-box thinker. Oh, yeah, yeah. Still a, a, a fascinating individual who came up with some pretty interesting ideas. All right. We got some messages in response to a Vault episode that aired recently, the one about school dreams, you know, the recurring dream where you have to go back and take the Russian calculus test. Mm -hmm. Some of these messages were in response to a question we asked at the end of the episode about um, whether people still have school dreams if they had uh, experiences other than just going up, graduating from high school and then maybe going on to college if people had – dropped out of school at an earlier age or had something else going on in their lives at that time, if they were homeschooled, how did that affect their propensity for school dreams? And so Kayla gets in touch with us to say, Hi, Joe and Robert. I missed the school dreams episode the first time around and was really intrigued to see it pop up. I knew that many people experience school dreams, but I assumed mine were unusual because of my background. Due to homelessness and a number of family issues, I dropped out of high school during my freshman year and got my GED. I only ever went to high school classes sporadically over a period of a few months. I had the added misfortune of having to change schools three times in this short period. I'm 30 now, putting my high school experience 15 years ago. Oof. I didn't start having school dreams until my mid-twenties when I started having them all the time. I was surprised to find that the basic premise of my dreams was so common. I find myself at my first high school on the last day of the school year. I panic, realizing there's a class I haven't attended all year. I remember that I couldn't find the classroom on my first day and was too afraid to ask anyone. I wander through a maze of high school, frantically searching for this class— It occurs to me that the teacher had gone out of their way to give a second chance to finish school, making me feel extremely guilty for letting them down. These dreams almost always end with me finding a huge glass door and leaving the building, trying to get away without being noticed. I'm on the fence about dream interpretation, but it's so interesting how these things can tie folks of all different backgrounds together. I associate these dreams most closely with my general feelings of anxiety and how it's affected my life at different times. It's worth mentioning that I generally don't regret or feel bad about having dropped out. I went down a different path, but it worked for me, and I have a great life now with a family and career. Just wanted to share to hopefully answer some of those questions. Love the podcast. Please keep quality dream-related content coming. Kayla. Oh, that's interesting. Hmm. Uh, As a side note, I recently had a school dream again, and uh, one of the amusing things about it is that in the school dream, it had been updated for the the COVID era because I was, I was, it it had to do with stress over uh, dialing into my classes, into my college classes and attending them virtually. 
And I, I forget, I've already forgotten the details of it. If I was having trouble connecting or, or if I'd forgotten the class, you know, that old trope. Uh, but, uh, but still, it was, it was amusing that, that had been updated for like COVID error class anxiety, despite that having obviously never been my experience going to school in the past. I don't know if it was like a, a, a combination of like my, my son's experiences uh, right now, uh, zooming into classes combined with my own, uh, uh, you know, uh, college error um, uh, anxiety about missing uh, classes. I don't know, but it was it was it was amusing, but also yeah, also I guess kind of frustrating too. Where you're like, come on, Dream World, is is there nothing better we can have than just a a timely updated version of the the the, the tired old school dream? Uh, yeah, that, that seems like the kind of thing that normally happens where a lot of times people bring current relationships and drama to their school dreams. So it's like mm-hmm. I was at school, I was missing a. You know, I I hadn't prepared for a test, but also my current co-workers were there with me and whatever kind of drama you've got going on with them was the background of it. Yep, life uh, life changes, but uh, the school dreams, they're, they're forever. But this next message has a very interesting variation. Robert, you want to read this one from James? Yeah, James writes, I think I have an interesting perspective on the idea of dreams, not from any research perspective. I'm a high school and college graduate, and my main job is a fireman and a paramedic. I did start this job in my early 20s, so I can't speak to dreams coming from your 20s memory bias. That being said, I never have school dreams, at least none that I can remember. I do have work dreams relatively often. All of these are ridiculous, as ridiculous as Russian calculus, but they're all, but they are related to just how often things can go wrong on the job. For example, just last night, I, uh, by serendipity, remember a dream about VTOC. Uh, I'm not going to get into the uh, totality of the dream. However, the biggest point that stuck with me was that I occluded an IV. This, if you're unfamiliar, is a process of stopping blood from flowing out of an IV prior to the tubing uh, being attached to the hub. Uh, I, I don't know what you're talking about, but but I'll let you carry on. Uh, it is also something I was initially bad at during my training. Uh, anecdotally, I would argue because my job is high stress and intensely chaotic, this outweighs the stress I would have felt in college or high school, neither of which I remember as particularly stressful. So I dream of fire and emergency medical calls gone wrong or just being off kilter rather than giving speeches in my underwear. Sincerely, James. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, it does sound very much like the school dream dynamic, except it's not about school. It's about this other kind of institutional challenge that you're repeatedly facing day after day in your early adulthood. But that's not all. James also had something to uh, contribute uh, to our discussion of snakes. Would you like to take this next part, Joe? Sure. Uh, James adds thoughts about the snake pit episodes in a separate email, and this was regarding the liver fascination. Remember in the episode we talked about all the different myths where – the, uh, people would be attacked by snakes and then it would say, and the snake was eating his liver or the right. snake was biting him right on the liver. And then we related this to other strange stories of uh, monsters attacking people in the liver, the eagle attacking Prometheus's liver, uh, the kappa trying to pull out your liver through your anus. W- what's going on here? James has a thought. James says, if you look at most predators eating, their initial attack is normally toward the stomach or abdomen. Um, Now, I'm not saying these animals are first going after the liver. If I remember correctly, they're after the guts to obtain plant nutrients while it's still fresh in the gut. However, from an observation deduction mindset, I would feel it's easy for an ancient observer to think that the animal is after the liver, being the liver is the largest and most prominent abdominal organ. As always, keep up the good work. Sincerely, James. I don't know if I'd ever heard that rationale for why predators very often attack the abdomen first. I think that is true that uh, after a predator is made a kill, they start eating at the abdomen. But but I'd never heard that it was to obtain plant nutrients from the prey animal's digestive system. I, I'll have to look into that, but that does sound plausible at least. All right. Well, we're 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 wading into the snakes now. We're about um, you know, an ankle deep, at least. So we're going to continue. Uh, here is another bit of listener mail. This came to us from Matt. 
Hey guys, a longtime listener, first time writer. Just finished the snake pit, I mean den episode, and loved hearing you talk about Narcissus. I live in Manitoba, just north of Winnipeg and east of Narcissus. Uh, but uh, took a road trip there a few years ago. It was early in the season, so the snakes weren't super crazy, but what a cool experience. Kids running around catching snakes, writhing balls of snakes in the dens. Uh, their, their color is such that at first glance, you don't think there's that many in the pit, but then your eyes start picking out more and more areas of movement. The sound uh, description is accurate, a persistent rustling. My photos suck as everything is just all earth colors. But here's a photo of a statue in Narcissus. Uh, right, uh, you're right uh, that the town is really just a few houses. And he includes this image of this um, this really fabulous Thulsa Doom-esque sculpture that they have there of these uh, kind of writhing, arching, uh, like what, gold and green snakes on top of a rock pile? I guess they're supposed to be the garter snakes that, that gather there at the dens, but yeah, obviously they're a little bit bigger. And w what I think is funny is that this statue has inverted the dynamic. The snakes come to n the Narcissus area because there are sinkholes and pits and, and you know holes in the limestone that are good for them to, to brewmate in. But this puts them atop a mountain of stone. It's a total a vertical inversion of the snake dynamic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, uh, and, and I do say it does sort of demand worship as well. What is the answer to the riddle of snakes? Also, Matt was not the only Manitoba listener we heard from. Becca got in touch, and I just want to read an excerpt from her email here. Uh, she says that uh, she loved that we mentioned that Manitoba snake pits are the largest in the world. And she goes on, I don't know how that's possible, but how excited I was to hear that you have no idea. Finally, I have something I can contribute to. It really is a nice Mother's Day activity. <laughs> it's a really small circular hike, approximately the size of a football field, I'd guess. The pits are guarded by a fence, but the snakes often slither across the track, so you have to walk slow. They are very docile, and in my experiences, don't seem to mind being picked up. It, it really is like a huge, writhing swarm. I don't know if I've ever picked up on the noise, but there is usually a lot of background noise going around. When I saw the movie Annihilation and saw the intestine scene, my first thought was, that's like the snake pits. <laughs> Um, and Becca attaches some photos for us to look at. Uh, so, yeah, thanks for getting in touch, Becca. All right. On that note, we're going to take one more break. But when we come back, more listener mail. All right, we're back. Now, a number of listeners wrote in on our episode on the spotlight effect. Remember the effect that uh, essentially finds that people think other people are paying more attention to them and noticing more about them than they actually are. So it's quite ironic that the next uh, bit of listener mail is another one from Jim in New Jersey. Uh, so, so Jim, please don't uh, make uh, – we hope we're not encouraging Spotlight Effect <laughs> by reading another, another one of your emails. Or that we're not giving into it by thinking that Jim only thinks about our show and writes in all the time. I mean, Jim is prolific. Well, what can you do? Uh, so Jim says, Robert and Joe, I think the Spotlight Effect can be summed up in this quote, for which I can't find the source – Everyone is the star of their own movie. Yeah, I think that's about right, Jim. Uh, so uh, he says, I don't think it's unreasonable for children and young adults to be subjected to the spotlight effect. Through the first 20 or so years of their lives, there's almost always a set of adults watching much of what children do, whether it's parents, family members, friends, teachers, etc. Why wouldn't they think they're the center of attention? They often are. Now, this is very interesting because... Some of the psychologists that we were talking about in that episode highlighted the fact that the spotlight effect is especially pronounced among, you know, teenagers. And yeah, it makes me wonder, is, is that something natural about the brain as it develops? Would, would it be that way no matter what was going on in the culture around them? Or is it because, you know, by teenage years, you are used to actually being the center of attention for so much of your life? Yeah, I don't know. You know, it also reminds me of something that came up recently about the podcast on the podcast, but I don't know if it was in this episode where we, we briefly discussed uh, the, uh, the idea that was uh, 
was certainly written about by uh, Iliade, but the, the the idea that 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 especially older cultures that anything you did was only meaningful in so much as it um, you know went through the paces of some uh, mythic um, trope. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you could you could sort of explain that as well as as being a, a statement of of the things I do are only important if they are doing the sort of things that uh, that central characters in other stories do. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I, so I could see that kind of um, uh, process playing into uh, this. Uh, everyone is a star in their own movie or in their own narrative thing. Jim goes on. I noticed the spotlight effect in U.S. politics, but I'm sure it applies to other countries' politics as well. It's very prominent during congressional hearings when members of Congress interrogate those who have been called in. From what I've seen, they are there to present more than to listen. Uh, Yeah, I do think that's often the case. You you see what what is ostensibly supposed to be, you know, the the member of Congress is supposed to be acting like a a prosecutor acquiring information or eliciting testimony from the witness. Very often they're clearly just performing to to create an impression about themselves. As for feeling less self-conscious about something, I think a new hairstyle is a good example. My wife's stylist might cut her hair much shorter than my wife desired. She often feels very self-conscious about it, but in a day or two, she doesn't even notice it. I don't have bad hair days myself since I sport the same head style as Jonathan Strickland. Uh, that's That's our colleague on Tech Stuff. That means not having hair. And then Jim finally finishes with a postscript saying, I just subscribed to Netflix about two months ago during COVID, and I'm working my way through Black Mirror. Ooh, Jim, take it slow. Don't don't get too down in the dumps. (laughs) It's it's a it's a tough time for that kind of a Yeah, totally. We're living in a Black Mirror episode already. Uh, but but Jim says, uh, finally, I saw Metalhead last week, so I knew the tree climbing robot dogs reference. Uh, I don't remember when we referenced that, but but good on you, Jim. Yeah, yeah, that's a that, that is a terrifying episode. Probably probably one of my favorites. All right, we have another one here. This one comes to us from Matt. Hi, Robert and Joe. Glad you're both able to stay safe and produce amazing content from the comfort of your respective bunkers. In your recent episode about the spotlight effect, you mentioned playing D and D over Zoom and it being exhausting. I may have a few suggestions to help. Number one, it's possible to hide the self view on Zoom. It's in the menu that appears after clicking on the three little dots uh, when you hover over your portrait. I find it helps. Number two, a D&D campaign seems like a perfect opportunity to have the players use their character avatars. Under settings, you can select a virtual background to use for the call. But if you cover your webcam, you disappear, but the background doesn't. Have each player put a picture of their character or reasonable fa- uh, facsimile as the vir- their virtual background and then close the webcam. Then nobody has to feel like they are in the spotlight. Maybe the DM has an image of a formless evil presence or something. Now the question becomes, will you still be tempted to stare at your avatar or <laughs> will you need to hide that as well? Stay safe, Matt. Well, I think these are some these are some great tricks. Uh, uh, I, I, you know, this email came in, I think, before my most recent session, and I tried to do some of these things, but then I realized, oh, we don't actually use Zoom for this. We use uh, Google Meet or something like that, and I, I'm even less sure how to pull the various bells and whistles on that one. Um, but I, I, I like the idea, yeah, of making myself go away and replacing it with my character's image as that would be more immersive. Because when we're playing, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm at the point with, with, with uh, doing remote D&D where a, a lot of the things that are difficult about it are really starting to, to grind me down. Uh, I, I'm really missing the, uh, the, the physical uh, hangout aspect of playing. And the part that I enjoy the most is, you know, getting immersive and, and being a character, um, uh, being my character through the, um, uh, th- through the interface. And something like that uh, sounds like it would be a good tool to use. I think this is about a shattering on TV that predates Terminator 2. Yeah, yeah, this is exciting. This because this because my part of my whole theory 
was, and I still stand by this, that Terminator 2 gave us a shattering scene that had a huge impact on other sci-fi movies and TV shows, and everybody wanted to do the same gimmick and use the same technology. Um, However, they do not seem to be the first. Carrie writes in and says, Hi, gentlemen. Love your show. I'm a truck driver and ingest a lot of podcasts and other audio formats. Just wanted to throw in a scene from a two-part miniseries, I think V from 1983. Now, uh, uh, I don't think I've ever seen V. I'm vaguely familiar with it. it it's uh, like an alien invasion show. Yeah, starring Mark Singer from Beastmaster. Yeah, he was in at least two episodes of it. I mean, you got you got Andrew Prine in there as well. Uh, uh, yeah, it looks like a, an interesting cast. Uh, Robert England shows up. Mm, I've never seen it, but maybe I got to look it up. All right, Carrie continues. A character in that gets his forearm and hand frozen by liquid nitrogen and then breaks it off, stumbling to safety. It's funny. I remember watching the entire series, but I only remember that, reptile people, and a woman with long black hair. I had to Google it for the year. (laughs) Keep up the good work. Your show is one of a few I have no problem re-listening to. Carrie. Well, thanks, Carrie. Now, now I got to check this out. It does look it, it looks like some early 80s TV production values magic. And certainly it does push the timeline back uh, uh, further regarding the uh, the beginning of our liquid nitrogen obsession. So perhaps James Cameron had watched V and thought, that's pretty good. I could do something with that. Yeah, I'd go whole body. You just do an <laughs> arm. That's weak. But now we've got homework for you. you. You listening out there, find us the earliest shattering of a human body on in film or in fiction. Where, where's, where's the earliest one? I got to know. Well, it, it, here's the, the other thing. It needs to be ice because you will find yes. um, okay. precursors that are stone. Uh, someone's turned to stone and then they shatter that way. But uh, particularly, I'm interested in ice. All right, next, you got a very brief note from Samantha. It just says, I just watched The Tingler. It was awesome. Thank you, Sammy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. P.S. I also went on an alien slash predator slash pred alien bing. I think she meant binge, but I like mm-hmm. bing even better. I went on an alien bing. And she says, y'all are rocking it. Well, thank you, Sammy. I'm, I'm glad you liked The Tingler. Uh, yeah, anytime we can turn people on to um, high-quality cinema like this, uh, I feel like we're doing our job right. What do we know about the Tingler? All right, here, there's another one. This comes as, uh, to us from August. Uh, hello, friends. A quick one. Just watch Star Wars Episode One and The Clone Wars. I think Robert mentioned doing the same. How about an episode about four-armed beings? I'm thinking about the pod racer uh, Gascano or the infamous general Palm Krell. Just a thought. Also, love the Pie Creed episode. More about materials, please. With love and admiration, August. Um, yes, uh, that's a great point about four-armed beings. Um, Joe, I don't know. I know you haven't seen Clone Wars, but perhaps if you think back to um, the movie Attack of the Clones, there's a scene where Obi Wan is in a, in a diner, uh, meeting with the diner operator, and he is a four armed alien. He is a uh, Basalsic, I believe, is the, the the name of the species. Wow. Yeah. I re- oh no. I, I don't want to start a fight. I I know that you're you're more of a prequel lover now than I am, but I do recall thinking mainly that that scene had some of the worst CGI I had ever seen in a major <laughs> motion picture. Uh, that that creature was 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 a crime. Oh uh, well, I think you're going to anger the Scorpion King with words like that, <laughs> Joe. Um, regardless, uh, this same species shows up in Clone Wars. Uh, there's this uh, there's this awesome character named General Pong Krell, and uh, and he is a, a force sensitive uh, uh, individual of this species. He wields uh, I think dual double sided um, lightsabers, and he's just an interesting character because. Um, uh, he's. I think he's really the first uh, Jedi that you encounter where you you begin to to uh, to, to question his motivations and his uh, devotion to the war. He's almost kind of a um, kind of a Kurtz type character uh, where you, you begin mm. to uh, to really um, recoil from the way that he he treats the clone troopers and how he's using them uh, on the battlefield. Uh, it's a really, that's a really great story arc with that character. I won't spoil anything for anybody, uh, but that's, that's one of the, the really good story arcs in the show. 
I looked up images and I will say this has the distinction of being the only character I've ever seen who looks like a really tough bad dude but also has a throat sack like a frog just a yeah. big jowly inflatable throat sack. Yeah, it's it, I feel like it's probably a really interesting design um choice on the, the makers of uh, the Clone Wars part because they took a character that you know that was designed as like an alien just an alien diner operator you know uh, and then they they made they used that species as the template for a totally different uh, style character uh, but it still it works really well yeah it's like could we make a, a like a tough badass jedi hut now back to the the number of arms yeah i don't know we could put, pretend, it would be potentially interesting to get into the whole four-armed multi-armed uh uh, discussion because, of course, we could talk about uh, Pong Krell. We could also talk about Goro, uh, we, we, we've touched on before. And then you can get into various other multi armed uh, entities from various mythologies. Uh, uh, you know, there's some really good ones out there. There's some, some in Greek uh, mythology with just way too many arms, as I recall. Mm-hmm. What, like 100 arms and so forth? Like, how do you even, how do you even use all those arms? I don't know. That's one of the things in ancient mythology and religion that often strikes me as the strangest is uh, the creatures that are imagined having this great multiplicity of body parts, say the visions in the book of Revelation with creatures with X many wings and X many heads, where at a certain point you just start imagining, I don't know how to even picture that or what those things would do. <laughs> you know, what is, why, why would you have 10 wings? Would that be useful? Yeah, it it tends to work so much better, in my opinion, anyway, uh, with 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 in Hindu iconography, mm-hmm. because you have first of all a visual representation of what this multi armed form would look like, but then also it's it's obvious that the visual uh, symbology is about um, portraying aspects of this divine being, like Mm -hmm. what are the things they are holding in their hands and how many hands do they have to hold those things and then what does that say about the capabilities of the divine? It's a lot simpler with Goro. What does Goro hold in his hands? Necks. That's it. Right, yeah. Or maybe like goblets, right? Yeah, (laughs) Goblets and necks, that's it. Goro only drinks from goblets. I can, you invite him over to your house, you offer him a mug of coffee. He's like, no, put it in a goblet. <laughs> okay, a couple more messages here, both related to Star Wars. This one is from Velen. Velen says, hi, Robert and Joe. I've been listening to Stuff to Blow Your Mind for about eight years, but I don't think I've ever written. I'm normally at least a month behind, and when I get the urge to write in, I always think I'm sure someone else has written about that in the meantime. But once you talk Star Wars, I'm ready to risk potentially repeating someone else. Oh, never <laughs> never be afraid, Velen. You know, pe- you know, sometimes we get uh, some duplicated sentiments, but that's okay. In your discussion of the mighty Sarlacc, I was waiting for someone to bring up the aspect that interested me the most, quote, a new definition of pain and suffering as you are slowly digested over a thousand years. Or that's what uh, C-3PO says that uh, Jabba, Jabba is promising them as they'll be thrown into the Sarlacc. Um, I always took that to mean that the victim is kept alive for a thousand years in order to experience this. However, even if you were to take it that the victim dies quite quickly, but their corpse is digested over a thousand years, then the digestive process takes longer to break down the body than it would take if the body were to decompose naturally. Whether the victim lives a thousand years or not, being digested by a sarlacc is still a kind of horrific preservation. Taking the more interesting reading, though, that the victim remains alive throughout the process, my first imagining is a monkey's paw scenario. I want to live for a thousand years. Sure, meet your new buddy, the Sarlacc. And the second thing that comes to mind while wondering how a Sarlacc might prolong sapient life is your two-parter, The Devourer of Memories, about planaria worms and whether they can incorporate memories by eating, and whether the extended life of a Sarlacc's victims is a shadowy existence as a memory in a worm. Hmm, very interesting. Uh, but I guess you don't have time to cover everything. Thanks for all the work that you put into researching and recording the show. And thanks also to Seth Nicholas Johnson for their efforts. It's a consistently excellent show. Regards, Velen. Always, always good to get a shout out for Seth. Seth does amazing work. Absolutely. Seth is the one who kind of stitches everything together uh, with the yeah. pieces that we provide. Um, uh, those are some wonderful uh, Sarlacc um, 
uh, thoughts there. Uh, it does bring me, though, back again to that short story I mentioned in that episode, um, A Bar of Like That, The Tale of Boba Fett uh, by J.D. Montgomery from Tales uh, from ba- Jabba's Palace, which is just a short mm-hmm. story from 1996, because um, uh, it's still been a very long time since I read it, but I was refreshing myself a little bit about it by reading a summary. And yeah, there's this whole bit where while he's in the belly of the Sarlacc, uh, Baba Fett is put in telepathic contact with one of its first victims. Um, and uh, and there are like flashbacks concerning other victims of the Sarlacc as well. So oh. there's a lot of really um, imaginative stuff that's pulled off in that story. And I'm kind of... I, I I have heard I have heard rumors that Boba Fett is coming back uh in the second season of The Mandalorian. Um I don't know if that's a, if that if it's real or if it's gonna be, you know, some other character pretending to be Boba Fett, but I'm hoping that if they do actually bring him back, uh they consider uh, getting some ideas from this particular short story. Um now obviously they already filmed it, they already written they've already written it, so whatever is gonna happen is gonna happen. But I hope that they I hope that they looked at this story because there's some cool cool ideas in it. All right, here's another uh, bit of listener mail. This one comes to us from Kale. Kale writes in and says, hey, Robert and Joe. First off, I want to say that I absolutely love the show. I really appreciate the work you guys put into it. I love the jokes and puns and recommendations you all put in as well. During the Sarlacc episode, you guys pondered the reason, uh, the reasons why Star Wars fans were so interested in Boba Fett. And I think it has to do with the Star Wars animated series, The Clone Wars. In this show, no spoilers, they delve into his story through multiple episodes, and it's very interesting. Also, I highly recommend watching it if you haven't, and especially if Robert has been sharing his love of Star Wars with his son. The show is enjoyable and very fun for children and adults alike. I wasn't even interested in watching the live-action movies until my part Partner showed me the animated series. Plus, there are lots of episodes set on planets with cool creatures and interesting alien races. If you have Disney Plus, you can stream it on there. I hope you all are staying safe and healthy. Sending much love and good vibes your way, uh, Kale. Now, uh, th- this, this of course, I should add that that Sarlacc episode came out before I did indeed start watching Clone Clone Wars with my son. Um, we are currently, um, let's see. What, what what season we're we? in like season six I think wow and uh, yeah we we we're loving it they did they've done they did such a great job creating the show um, and and it's a show that again kids and adults can both enjoy it's just light years ahead of any of the animated series I had access to as a kid uh, I love the development that they give all the main characters as well as all these side characters and some of the more obscure guests that pop up uh, some great uh, monsters and creatures in there as well but indeed Boba Fett like a young Boba Fett does show up and is an interesting character they have him sort of bouncing around the universe falling in with some uh, some other bounty hunters and also seeking revenge, because uh, of course uh, he wants revenge on Mace Windu, uh, the uh, the individual who killed his father. Uh, mm. And of course, Mace Windu is a, a very very dangerous um, uh, object for one's revenge. I keep feeling like at some point I'm just going to have to watch this show, or else I'm never going to be able to relate to you again, <laughs> because it's like, <laughs> it's like half your brain now. Um, yeah, it is. It's become uh, yeah my main jam uh, this yeah. uh, COVID season. Uh, is this also the source of that that uh, amazing spider lad you shared with me? The 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 magnificent oh, yeah. gentleman with the walrus mustache style chelicery. Yeah, Admiral Trench, who's uh, like a big um, uh, uh, admiral tarantula creature that shows up fighting for the separatists. Yeah, very good. Okay, well maybe yeah. maybe I'll get there sometime in the near future. I will say though, I think I want to disagree with something Kale said, which is that that the uh the fascination with Boba Fett could be rooted in uh the character appearing in and having a good storyline in the Clone Wars. This definitely predates the Clone Wars TV show. I remember when I was a kid, my Star Wars friends were obsessed with Boba Fett. And I thought he was cool, but I still even then didn't quite get it. It's like you just don't know much about him. And I think maybe that's part of it. He was exciting because he had cool looking armor and you didn't know much about him. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely, I absolutely agree with that. Um, but, uh, but I will say that you know, when when the storytelling is is really on point, um, you know, the mystery can be transformed into something uh, something even more satisfying. Uh, like another example of this, 
is that uh, the, you have the character of Darth Maul, who, of course, shows up in The Phantom Menace, is a really interesting-looking character. We don't know much about them, and uh, they, are, uh, they are seemingly slain at the end of that movie. Well, Clone Wars brings him back. And I knew that Clone Wars was going to bring him back, and I was a little uh, suspicious of it. I'm like, hey, he was cut in half. I don't really know that I need Darth Maul to come back. Um, he was only so interesting. There's the mystery of the character, et cetera, et cetera. But I have to say, they did a really fabulous job bringing him back. The, the, the Darth Maul return arc uh, that occurs on Clone Wars is, is superb stuff. And they made the character far more interesting uh, than, 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 than anything he had going for him in Phantom Menace. Was, is he, I don't know, I'm cutting half pretty bad, Dewey. <laughs> oh, I mean, um, it's, I don't want to give much away, but basically imagine, uh, you know, a character like that that is, that is, that has survived all these years just mostly based on hate. Like, that's mm. the power of the dark side is, um, you know, sufficiently uh, evil characters. They never really die because they're too hateful. They're too, too awful to, to pass on to another existence. That's right. Build yourself an armor of hatred and evil. <laughs> the lesson of Star Wars. <laughs> well, you are tempting me because I got to know, does Darth Maul talk? Uh because he's only got yes, like two lines in, in the movie, right? Yes, he does talk. And in fact, a, a really awesome uh, voice actor by the name of uh, Sam Witwer, uh, or perhaps it's Witwer. I'm not sure I haven't heard his name uh, pronounced out loud. But um, he, he does the voice, and uh, it's terrific. Like, he's able to really inject this kind of desperate, doomed pain into the character. Uh, because he's, uh, like, you really get the sense of a character that should have died, uh, that is alive just purely because of his hate. And, um, yeah, it's, it's just fabulously done. All right, well, there we have it. Um, we're going to go ahead and close it out there. Uh, we had a, a lot of great listener mail that we were able to read in this episode. We also received a lot of great listener mail that we just didn't have time for here today. Uh, and as always, I just want to let everybody know, just remind you, you know, we 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 rarely respond to listener mail um, via email, and we can only read so much of it on the show, but we do read everything that comes in and we do greatly appreciate hearing from everybody. Everybody has, has such great uh, perspective on the topics that we cover, additional factoids, uh, also um, listener suggestions for episodes are always helpful. So just keep, keep sending it in and we'll keep trying to put out listener mail episodes. Uh, maybe not every month, but you know, um, uh, as regularly uh, as, as we can. And in the meantime, if you would like to check out other episodes of Stuff to Blow Your Mind, you can find us wherever you get your podcast and wherever that happens to be. We just ask that you rate, review, and subscribe. Huge thanks, as always, to our excellent audio producer, Seth Nicholas Johnson. If you would like to get in touch with us with feedback on this episode or any other, to suggest a topic for the future, or just to say hello, you can email us at contact at stufftoblowyourmind.com. Stuff to Blow Your Mind is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.